Hey y'all, new day, new verse, and a chance to gather together before our throne. Well, sort of new verse. It's definitely an opportunity to gather anew today. And Father God, we just invite you for it. Lord, give the words, give the understanding, give the direction. Let this be a place of healing, Lord God, a place of restoration. A place of just being able to lay the weight down at your cross, at your feet, and to stand up strengthened and anew, no longer bent over so people laid under chains of oppression by the enemy, but able to stand true, spine, heels, necks, made whole, souls set right, living from a place of shalom, your shalom, in Jesus' name. So the verse that I got with today was more kind of fitting toward what we were going on. It came from a being placed in, of uh, LB's uh, sermon from uh, Elevation Church. There'll be more on it the Thursday one. The day of the verse is that uh, today's verse is just 16 and 17. And mostly 17. And we've gone over this before. It's Matthew 28 verse 17. And we did this before when we went over the Matthew sermon, or the Matthew section and going through Matthew. I wanted to bring it up because of what we're going to be talking today. So let's get into the verse. Verse 17. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. I wanted that little verse because I think part of the problem in Christianity is the doubt. And here's what I mean. Like, no, oh, you, you, you're not supposed to doubt. I'll wag the finger. Uh, uh, bah. My favorite verse in the entire thing is, Fine, I believe. Help me with my unbelief. And Jesus doesn't ream the Father in any way, shape, or form. He heals the kid, brings him back to life, and then looks at his disciples and go, You lot, that way. We talk now. See, I think it's the fact that these guys doubted. Because, like, he, some of them doubted. Even seeing his resurrection, even seeing him there, why did they doubt? Clearly it wasn't the miracle. Clearly it wasn't the resurrection. He's standing right there in front of him. So what did they doubt? It wasn't him. He's sitting there right there in front of us. Like, yes, I doubt that this remote is actually here. I'm holding it. I'm touching it. I'm bouncing it off my head. But I totally doubt it's there. No. Obviously not. <laughs> because if he's right there with them. Even the elect disciples, they left Galilee. They went to the mountain. They told them to go. They saw him. They worshipped him. But some of them doubt. So what is it they're doubting? Not doubting him. He's right there. They're even worshiping him. I think what they're doubting is God's way of doing it. And here's what I mean. A lot of interpretations of that time for the Tanakh, and even some still today, are waiting for Messiah to be a great military leader are waiting for Messiah to be somebody like David, somebody who takes names, kick ass, and leaves a wake of blood in their path. I smelt the unrighteous and have exalted the weak. I have slain the fallen ones. Except in Revelation, the sword isn't in his hand. It's in his mouth. And he's pre-bloodied before he shows up. Because it's already his blood there. It's not... Oh, wiping out of the wicked. It's a severing of creation that doesn't want anything to do with him so it can't ruin the new creation. So that those who decided, my will is to have nothing to do with God, congratulations, you get it in the end. You will have nothing to do with the creative source and then you will be unmade. It's the language from Genesis, which admittedly is why I find it a bit more horrifying than most religion pointing it. Oh, you'll burn in a lake of fire for all eternity and darkness and... Yeah, okay, but um, when, when you read it, it's, this, uh, it's the same language as Genesis. It's, it's decreation. It's to be unmade. It, it's the concept of nothing, unthingness. Be, because the human being decided they didn't want to love. Because the human being decided they didn't want to have faith, they didn't want to have hope, they didn't want any of it. So what are they doubting? They're doubting his way of doing it, I'd imagine. Because in the new kingdom way of doing it, that Jesus' uh, death and resurrection show fully the kingdom of heaven is here, is that very understanding in Revelation. He's pre-bloodied. The uh, sword's in his hand, not his mouth. The way his kingdom does it, 
isn't like the way the world does it. I mean, he said it to Pilate himself. Mate, if I play, if my kingdom were like your kingdom, my followers were, would be up here right now and you would be getting run through. That's not how my kingdom works. It's not a kingdom of violence. It's a kingdom of peace. And I think part of the reason that there's that difficulty with non-Christians, with, with Christ believers, is because we have a fair bit of hypocrisy when it comes to that. We proclaim grace, but we don't show it. We sing of mercy, but we refuse to pour it out. We may in bits and pieces on an individual level, but on mass, we won't even be merciful to our own branches. The Methodist church decided it was better to cut in half than it was to hear each other out. The 10,000 subsects of Christianity that would rather abuse each other than come together and see each other for their beauties. We are supposed to be a kingdom of peace, and yet we are more divided than the world around us. Worse, we will get into the same divides as the world around us because we will start deciding that an elephant or a donkey mean more to us than Nisi, who is our banner. Because most believers and most non-believers, too, those who have been hurt by Christianity, they haven't been hurt by God. They've been hurt by Christians who were deciding to run his name through the mud. And I've been there myself. So when I read the first two of the ten words from Exodus, Thou shalt not have, uh, thou shalt have no other gods before me, and thou shalt not make uh, any graven images. Sorry, I was trying to brand in the King James Version and a couple other versions that I read together with it. You know, that idea that don't take the Lord's name in vain, it's not talking about using profanities. It's talking about saying, I'm a Christian! Damn you, fool! No. I mean, James was actually quite adamant about that, about talking out of both sides of your mouth. And he was nodding to Proverbs because this is the brother of Jesus. His primary influences are Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, and Proverbs. And he speaks to it so much. So does Proverbs. Praising the Lord of all creation out one side of his mouth and then cursing his creation out the other side? Yes, you're a beautiful artist. It's a wonderful piece, Mr. Van Gogh. I've never seen such a more bonnet. Starry Night's just an ugly piece of shit, isn't it? Oh, Da Vinci, we love you, you're a genius, you're incredible. You barely understand math and your color palette sucks, but you're an incredible artist. Oh, Michelangelo, your sculptures are beautiful. Am I getting the point across? You can't tell the artist they're incredible and then crap all over their work. That just makes you a hypocrite. You can't say, I choose to love and then spit in somebody's face because they offended you. Offense happens. Offended is optional. And offended happens when forgiveness is less important than mercy. And mercy, or when forgiveness and mercy are less important than holding on to pain. My apologies, I misspoke there. Yeah, somebody may run their mouth and slight you. People usually don't think about what they're saying. And thanks to Twitter, there's not a whole lot of filter there left. Thanks to that wonderful aspect of anonymity, people will say all sorts of crap nowadays. And yeah, it can offend. They may say some of the worst stuff possible. And they may do it entirely to be offensive. So? That's their choice. Free will is a God-given gift. What we do with it matters. The person who is being a prat, they made that choice. Their free will choice was to be an asshole. All right. My free will choice is to not receive it. Because I don't want to spend the mental energy. I don't want to spend the spiritual energy. Really, I just don't care enough because I have better stuff to do. I'm not going to argue with somebody who's not going to hear me for me. It's like talking to a brick wall, although less fun. It's at least a brick wall you can draw shapes on in your mind. So, why does the world have such a problem with it? It's because we won't be real about it. And when we fail, instead of saying, you know, oh yeah, no, I totally failed. And being contrite and being humble. 
not needing a PR firm to make the call out for us, but saying, you know what, yeah, I've, I buggered. I'm sorry. I really did. Not a fake apology, but a genuine one. And I'm not talking take it out to the public square. We know how to do this from Matthew. I'm talking just being genuine. So that you can be honest with the flock, that you can be honest with your friends, that you can be honest and real. Because if you're not truthful with the people you can see, how can you be honest with the God whom you can't? If you won't be honest with the people you can see, how could you possibly be honest with the God whom you can't? Especially when lying to ourselves is easier than lying to other people. Other people, you have to keep the line straight but when you lie to yourself. That's just whatever delusional writing we decide to go along with that day. Oh, I'm just a tired, broken, crippled person. No, you're not. You're dealing with tiredness. You're dealing with being crippled. Only part of that sentence is actually true is you're a person. I'm weak. You have a place for strength for God to move. I'm broke. You have God's provision opportunities that he can show off if you let him. Focusing on the healer more than the healing. Focusing on the reality. The reality in which we live for and from. So that we're not looking like the world and behaving like the world and being hypocrites for it and running his name through the mud for it. What if Christianity became known for being the, the faith, the faith that went out to heal those places? So that when people hear, oh, you're a Christian, it's not a flip of the coin to if you're going to meet somebody who's more in line with Mother Teresa or more in line with Adolf. Because we use the word a lot in places we probably shouldn't. The Lord himself told us what is good. The Jew uh, to do justice, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with our God. This is not a European faith. This is some Middle Eastern belief. It is Messianic Judaism. <laughs> this is a Messianic Jewish faith. So when we use 2,000 years of Christian history to abuse each other, we forget our own story. And no wonder religion ends up making the same mistakes the kings did. Damn near in the same timing. All the way to the Pope gambling in, the, and I don't remember which one this was, but I know it was back well before 19, like well before 1700s. But of a freaking Pope rolling dice in the Vatican saying, come on, Zeus. Oh, gee, I've seen that in Kings before. Well, now that we've all made the same screw-ups, maybe we can take a moment and realize it's not about getting it right. It's about getting it right with. What if that became our sermon? What if that became the place we preach? That the idea of getting right with is as simple as turning away from your own BS and the brokenness and turning to the life light. To stop looking in Plato's cave and going, yes, it's this, and to seek the source. He is holy. He is pure. We need Jesus so we can run right in. It's his lap we're sitting on. The triune God inviting us to say, hey, I know you doubt. If you come along the way, I'll show you. Is he'll help us with our unbelief so we don't have to abuse each other as believers. And we don't have to live lives of falsehoods that other non-believers can call out in an instant. And living lives of hypocrisy, living lives of truth. Because we're not really honest about our problem with hurt. We bury it. We pretend it didn't happen. We circle the wagons. We do whatever the expression may be. But we're not really real. And we're not, when we're not, the secular world knows it. Hell, thanks to social media, everybody will know it and give it long enough. So what if we didn't put on airs? What if we were truly and simply ourselves? Joyful for the day we are given, honest about the difficulties we go through, and rejoicing and praising God all the same. 
rejoicing in God and praising Him all the same. Not because the situation is good, but because He is. Knowing that the trials and difficulties and storms will be places of refinement so we can say, hey, yeah, I whoops. And God will fix it. He'll help me do it. And I am going to do what it is to be set right and to do right. Not because of guilt, but because of conviction. Knowing what He did for us that makes us want to do it for others. Because if it's born out of relationship, it's real. If it's born out of regulation and right, it lasts as long as the carrot and the stick does. The moment you stop caring for either, neither work. That's why God doesn't use the carrot or the stick. He waits for us. An age of grace where we can but turn because He wants us to. A father welcoming his kids home. A good, good father welcoming his children in. So that we as Christians don't have to be hypocrites. We can be real. And our lives truly be a source of hope for those who don't know. Being real in those places when we and where we doubt. Being honest with each other. Walking arm in arm, hand in hand. Because we're made in His image. Man and woman, he created them. We are all made in his image. So what if we took the time to believe that? To be honest about the problems we're going through. That he cares enough to listen. That he cares enough to hear us as his own. So that when we meet somebody who we may not agree with, we can hear them out. When we meet somebody who may not fit our understanding of Genesis, we can praise God that He is going to make a way through. Do we trust that God is bigger? Because if we don't, we're always going to be hypocrites. You can't profess to have belief in the all-creator, all-powerful source of the universe and then tell your problems that they're bigger than your God. That's not how it works. So who's bigger? Your God or your problems? Because if your God's bigger, then everything that else that comes up is gravy along the way. If your problems are bigger, then you're worshipping them, not God. We don't have to agree with each other. We do have to make peace. There is a difference. When we forget that, when we try and force our definitions, when we become mandatory in our phrasing, we lose the point. Compulsory language can't be used inside the church. It can't be used outside the church either. Truth speaks for itself. Let it. Don't try to defend it. Just let it have its day because the Lord will be known. He will be known for His glory. He will be known for the glory and righteous praise to His name. And the miracles He does, He will do because Christianity has worked His name through the mud. So the miracles He does are about us. They're about Him. So the people know who he is and what he's done. So that when we sing a song of praises, it is about who he is and what he's done. We rejoice, it is about who he is and what he's done. Because if we look like the world but profess to be different, we lie to ourselves and others. We're in here. We're not from here. The place where we're from as believers, faith, hope, and love are the attire of the party. Grace and mercy are the name of the game. 
And forgiveness is how you get forgiven. In this kingdom, you don't hold on to somebody's sin. You forgive it and you let it go. So if you're not going to do that, what are you going to do to it? Hold on to it forever until it buries you? What is Jesus' question about it? Just reiterating the same. If you won't forgive, how do you expect to be forgiven? Yeah, I get the doubt. Because this upside down kingdom way of doing it is radically different than our own. But that's the point. It's okay to doubt. Run to Him. He's big enough for your doubts. So that we don't look like hypocrites to the outside world. And we can actually look like little children running to our Abba. That we can truly be a city on a hill filled with people who are salt of the earth. A game, not a religion, a religion, a wedding feast where all are invited. And God at the end of us. We just show up with the right attire on and do the next right thing. Loving others as we are loved in Him. I think that was the thing I was going for, thinking on. And you are, we are loved. As God loves Jesus, we are that love. We are so loved. What if we lived in such a way that we were honest about our doubts so that we weren't hypocrites? We were real. So those who have the same questions can come running with them and not be afraid or ashamed. You don't have to have the right answers. You just have to get right with the one who has them all. And the way you do that is to stop trying to do it yourself. Let your papa carry the love. Get your big brother clean up and send you the right way. Jesus will wash all of you if you let him. You just gotta be willing to let him. He'll wash out the hypocrisy. He'll wash out the fear. He'll wash out the hurt. He'll wash us and set us clean. You just gotta trust him to do so. Because that's who he is. And that's why we have faith. Because if we focus on the pain, if we focus on the problems, if we worship our weakness, they'll always have the final say. If we trust our God, lay it all out, be real before Him, and live to the hilt as though we are truly His and His alone, then no unbeliever will have room to call us hypocrites. Because we'll have been living our whole lives the same. No person will have room to curse. Because we'll have been living the same. So that is the kingdom manifesto says. In that moment, even if they do curse us, in Christ we rejoice. Because we're closer to God for it. Not getting cursed because we act the world and expect it to kiss our ass. Just because, oh, we did the same thing but same a different name. How'd that go in Acts? Most of those people got their asses because of the demons they tried to cast out. We stop being hypocrites by living our life to the fullest before him. Our lives and ever pleasing aroma sacrifice. Knowing that when we stumble and fall, He'll give us strength to get back up. And knowing that as we follow Him, He'll keep us from falling in the first place. It's about trust. It's about relationship. It's about love. The active, other-centered, other-focused choice. He's made it for us. Will we make it for Him? Will we make it for others? Because the two are one of the same. When we cry out, Lord, help me with my unbelief, He will. Don't worry your prayers. Trust that He will. Because the 
more you rest in him, the more you'll never be the same. He seeks to make you new. Let his favor be upon you. I'll see you then.